Hello, good evening. I'm Jenny Hampton from All Meadows and welcome to the second in our series of online talks. Um, we're absolutely delighted that Stephen Moss has agreed to talk for us tonight. Um, we have a presentation um, from Stephen followed by a Q&A discussion led by Kevin Cox, chair of the RSPB, but also a keen member of All Meadows. Um, so there's plenty of time for questions um, afterwards. So can I please ask you to post your questions in the chat window um, down the side of the YouTube screen? Um, we'll get through as many of those as we can um, after the talk. But I would just urge to stick those in as you think of them throughout the talk. Uh, if you're watching through the Eventbrite window, you can click through into YouTube just by clicking on the YouTube text at the bottom right of the window, and that should take you through to that uh window where you can post your questions um as we wait for anyone else to join us um just use the chat to say hi um and maybe where you're from because we've had people as far afield um as denmark and switzerland for our last talk so um really interesting to see where where people have come from um before we start i'd just like to say a few words about more meadows for those joining us tonight who aren't familiar with um, our activities. So Moor Meadows is a Dartmoor-based community group um, of about 800 landowners, farmers and gardeners who are restoring and creating flower-rich grasslands on all sorts of scales from meadows on shed roofs to acres of hay meadows. And anyone, um, as anyone with any meadow knows, um, they bring in life and a well-established one contains a huge abundance and diversity um, and they're really some of our best wildlife habitat. So we invite members to add their meadows, however small, to the Devon Meadows map, which can be found on our website. Um, and in total, we've topped over a thousand acres of wildlife rich meadows that have been restored or in the process of being restored. Um, a lot of it on Dartmoor, but actually increasingly um, beyond, um, beyond Dartmoor. Uh, and partly because of that, things seem to be spreading and people are getting quite infused across Devon. We've just launched a new project uh, funded by the Devon Environment Foundation, which is to support the formation of other meadows groups across Devon. And so to that end, we've created an online forum 
um, which I'll share the link with you at the end of the evening, the Meadow Makers Forum, where people with any interest in meadows can um, communicate with each other, share information about their projects, um, recommend books, links, start discussions, ask questions and all those kind of things. It's really a sort of communication platform. And what's really useful over something like Facebook is that all that knowledge uh, and those resources and conversations are all stored in there and they're all searchable so you can delve in and look for the answers to those questions that you remember someone posting from sort of months or years back. Um, we've set up different areas in the forum where people can start up their own groups and we've already got some sort of um, starter groups and groups springing up in West Devon in the Black and in Blackdown Hills as well so that's that's brilliant. Um, I'll put the link as I say in the chat box at some point and um, do take a look and join us if it's for you and if you're interested in meadows which I imagine you might be if you're here tonight. So I'm now going to hand over to Kevin who's going to introduce our, um, our speaker this evening. Thank you Kevin. Thanks Tracy. That's, that's great and good evening everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. I'm delighted to, uh, to be introducing Stephen. Um, Stephen and I have been friends for quite a while and um, I will enjoy having a chat with him later on. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Stephen is pretty much one of our great renaissance men for natural history. Um, there's, there's almost nothing he hasn't done uh, he's uh, a writer, he's a broadcaster, um, he's done television programmes, he was the original producer of Springwatch, for example, he's worked with everybody from David Attenborough, Bill Oddy, Chris Packham, you name it, uh, Stephen, Stephen knows them and has worked with them. He's written, I was going to say countless books, I'm sure he's counted them, but um, uh, he he's prolific as an author and... Um, and some absolutely amazing books. I thoroughly recommend one called Mrs. Morrow's Warbler, partly because I'm in it, uh, and it's great. And we had a great trip to uh, to Tanzania to find Mrs. Morrow's Warbler, one of the uh, the highlight trips that I've ever done bird watching. Um, he writes the bird watch column for the Guardian. Uh, he's done BBC Radio Four series on farmland birds, which will be relevant to what he's talking about today. He's also president of the uh, Somerset Wildlife Trust, um, and he leads a course in uh, travel and nature writing at Bath Spa University. Um, and finally, and last but not least, he was until uh, last October uh, on RSPB Council with me. So um, I'm sure I've missed some things. Uh, Stephen, but I'm delighted that you can join us this evening and I'm really looking forward both to your talk and then having a conversation afterwards. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Kevin. That's very kind. Um, yeah, but remember that we still have the cover story that our trip to Tanzania was a research trip. It was not, as Mrs Moss called it, a jolly. Um, although, of course, it was. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. Obviously, to Kevin and Donna and Steve and Tracy, um, who've all been involved in, in sorting this out tonight. Some of you, I'm sure, may have come to the fantastic conference that Donna organised three years ago now, three and a bit years ago. I think it was July 2017. Um, so I had the pleasure of meeting some of you there um and you know there's an awful lot of water under the bridge since then isn't there things have changed a lot but what's really impressed me is how more meadows has gone from a you know a, a great idea perhaps you know a year or two before that through that conference and has developed as tracy said into such a fabulous thing so tonight i'm gonna um be i'm gonna share my screen with you now if i can hang on i ought to be getting used to this shouldn't i we do this all the time now uh so you should be seeing a nice shot of a uh, wildflower meadow. Um, and it's beautiful, isn't it? We all know how beautiful wildflower meadows are. Um, and one of the really shocking things now, and it's even more shocking given that 
very few people remember what things were like before. I certainly don't. Not even Kevin does. Um, the fact that we've lost 97 percent. I mean, it's a, it's a statistic most of you, I'm sure, will have heard. But 97 percent of our wildflower meadows have gone since the 1930s. And, and that basically means we've turned things from this into that. And I, I remember a few years ago, probably 10, 15, 20 years ago, when I, was, I think I was filming a program on farmland and someone was talking about improved grassland. And I was like, oh yeah, that, that, sound, that sounds good. And then they explained, no, no, they mean improved um, like this. Uh, and, you know, it is such a tragedy. And of course, you know, it goes without saying that we absolutely need to use a lot of our land for producing food and a lot of farmers get a really bad press. And I'm sure some of you are farmers or, or farm the land you own. And, and, you know, I think it is it's the system that's broken, clearly, not the not the not not what's, you know, individuals are doing. Um, but it is a pretty shocking statistic, the idea that these these wildflower meadows have disappeared. And of course, that basically means that that because of this notion called the shifting baseline syndrome, we think of wildflower meadows now as somehow special. And we shouldn't. We should think of them as normal. But of course, we don't because everything's changed. So rather like a, a you know, younger generations. I remember the shock I felt a few years ago when a, a younger colleague of mine at the Natural History Unit, who'd now be in her late 30s, but she was in her 20s then, she went off to twitch a turtle dove at Portland because she'd only ever seen one before. And, you know, what a great rarity this bird was. And, you know, that was a bit shocking for me. And the, obviously the same is true of so many familiar wildflower plants. Um, the reason for this, of course, it goes right back to as I said, the late 1930s, early 1940s, when we needed to be self-sufficient and dig for victory. And I'm going to show you a clip now that I did show at that conference three and a half years ago. So forgive me if you've seen it, but it's worth seeing again. And it's a clip from a series I made, video clip from a series I made called Birds Britannia, which, as Brett Westwood said to me, was basically um, what have birds ever done for us? And also, of course, what have we done to birds and this particular three or four minute uh, video clip shows that so Tracy if you wouldn't mind running the video thank you a short while ago this was the 6,000 acre wilderness of Peltwell Fen in southwest Norfolk where nothing grew save reeds and weeds scrubland of peat and bog where floods more frequently than not turned it into a vast morass but it has taken a war to turn that same wasteland into an agricultural gold mine the Ministry of Agriculture has set to work an army of men reclaiming the idle acres. Across the fen... As the war dragged on, with national food shortages and the prospect of widespread starvation, desperate measures had to be taken. So huge swathes of our countryside were ploughed up for agriculture. The entire emphasis was on maximising production. And you can only do that by taking out what you call the wasteland, and wasteland included um, half of all our ancient woodlands, 70% uh, of our heathlands. I think we've now lost 99% of our flower-rich meadows. Any habitat that wasn't yielding agricultural produce was converted to arable or to farming in some way. The irony was that the more we planned and organised and structured the future of the British countryside, the more we lost sight of some of these aesthetic and romantic impulses that people had for the landscape and for the birds that lived within it. During the post-war years, the juggernaut of the agricultural revolution was unstoppable, fueled by subsidies and new technology. It was goodbye to the old-fashioned values of Tony Pippet and welcome to the brave new world of men in white coats. And the boffins came up with what appeared to be the perfect solution to improving productivity. There was a bright new future for Britain, not only for industry, but also for the countryside. And so in the late 1950s and into the 1960s, we sought to get rid of inefficient farming methods and systems and replace them with cutting-edge new technologies at the time. 
And one of those technologies was the application of pesticides and the birth of what we now know as chemical farming. So you suddenly had this interesting combination of a bunch of chemicals that could kill pests um, and a need to increase food production. And at face value, it must have seemed very straightforward. You know, you get more of a crop if you remove the weeds because the crop gets all the food from the soil. But these revolutionary new farming methods were having terrible effects on our countryside birds. The two main problems were the destruction of habitat and the widespread use of pesticides. One, it was degrading the whole landscape and a lot of the wildlife depended on the wild plants, the rough bits of the countryside, the wet bits and so on and so forth. And if you've spent lots of time and effort wiping out the so-called pests, what that means is that when you kill the moths, you kill the butterflies, you kill the caterpillars, and you actually remove that element of the food chain. As a result, the populations of many farmland birds went into freefall. Eventually, environmentalists woke up to what was happening and began to warn against the catastrophe of a silent spring. But when it came to a choice between farming and birds, there could only be one winner. There was a kind of illusion, I think, in government and actually in society more widely that what was good for agriculture was good for the countryside. People believed that the countryside was safe in the hands of farmers. But I think no one really had grasped the fact that actually there was a, a, a difficult choice to be made between maximising agricultural production and attempting to maintain a kind of rich, diverse wildlife in the countryside. One man who witnessed a calamity in the countryside at first hand was the author Henry Williamson, whose books, including Tark at the Otter, had made him a household name. After the, Hit after the Hitlerian War, when I had sold my farm and returned to North Devon and my writing, the general use of other sprays on arable and grasslands caused the deaths of a great number of birds, including such predators as sparrowhawks, owls and buzzards. Williamson, a farmer himself, recalled finding a family of grey partridges, all poisoned by chemicals. I came across the two birds crouched side by side in death, with their chicks slightly larger than humblebees, cold between the protecting feathers. It's a fairly horrific um, clip, that, isn't it? It, it gets better. <laughs> we show the positive side in that programme as well. But I think what that shows is, is a very understandable need to dig for victory to grow food led to a post-war settlement, if you like, that really laid waste to the countryside. And I was surprised when I read um, Isabella Tree's book, Wilding, which I'm sure many of you have read, excellent book, um, Isabella, of course, from NEP. I hadn't appreciated that, that that it was not a done deal that we would carry on this very um, mechanised industrial farming. And I'm just going to read a little bit of what she wrote, because I found this really fascinating. Other celebrated farmers like George Henderson, author of the best-selling The Farming Ladder, published in 1944, also campaigned for a return to the traditional mixed farming system. His farm in the Cotswolds had successfully weathered the agricultural depression of the 1930s and at the outset of the war had the highest outputs per acre in Britain. The Ministry of Agriculture had used it as a showcase farm, bussing people to the Cotswolds to learn from it. Maintaining the natural fertility of the soil, Henderson was convinced, was the key. If all of Britain was farmed this way, he wrote, our country could easily feed a population of 100 million people. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? Because for a long time, 
various vested interests have claimed that it's a binary choice between wildlife and and starvation on one hand that we wouldn't be able to feed ourselves or mechanized farming chemical farming and the ability to feed the population but he and many others at the time believed that that wasn't the case that actually in the long term if you farmed sensibly and the fact that he had the highest yields is interesting isn't it this wasn't you know a hobby farmer as we call them nowadays perhaps this was someone who clearly knew what they were doing and the next sentence, I won't read any more, but well, here we are. Henderson was adamantly against continuing farm subsidies after the war. They would be disastrous for the country in the long run, he warned, removing all incentive instinct and self-reliance for farmers, creating a culture of dependency and giving bureaucrats control over what farmers did with their land. However, the National Farmers Union disagreed. Oh, that's a surprise. Um, well, look, you know, isn't that interesting that, that we nearly got it right and we didn't and the result was disastrous and as a result and because of the rise of science and science obviously which 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 brings so many good things to our lives and as chris bain said it did very well it did what it set out to do extremely well the pesticides worked they killed all the pests unfortunately they killed everything else as well and of course you know with with the the constant um drive for cheap food my aunt, who turned 90 on Monday, is one of the few people left in Britain who remembers when a chicken, any piece of chicken, but a whole chicken, was a, a treat. You had it, you know, sort of equivalent, I suppose, of a goose today or something or, you know, or an entire site, you know, an entire poached salmon. You had it as a special treat. She said they used to have it at Easter, that she was from Devon. So this was in Devon before the Second World War. Um, so, people, you know, the idea that that mechanized farming would take over and of course it drove down prices it helps consumers are very happy with it supermarkets are very happy with it farmers i think often less happy because they have to produce everything at such a low cost but i think the meadows were probably the most obvious apart from hedgerows perhaps they were the most obvious casualty of all this um and is when i went to net recently charlie burrell told me a very interesting thing he said they showed they invited the local farmers as they've done many times at net they invited a whole load of people from slightly further afield in sussex to see it and he said the farmers were by and large pretty hostile towards what he and isabella were doing their children the younger generation were really interested you know so how how does it work then but he said the most interesting thing was that a few of the farmers brought along their parents who were in their 80s and they just remembered land like nep in the sussex countryside before the war they remembered the wildflower meadows they're the last generation who remember them and soon they'll be gone um so you know clearly from the environmental point of view this was a a, a huge disaster so i think the problem now is that we think of wildflower meadows as this sort of quaint relic of the past uh, it's almost like the epitome of the bolt-on luxury you know, a lot of people regard nature as a bit of an added extra. You know, it's not really important. It's just, it's nice if we can have it. But possibly wildflower meadows maybe have, that they almost epitomise that um, in that they're seen as ground that isn't, you know, used properly. Um, but then we have to think about, obviously, the role they play um, in maintaining biodiversity in the countryside. Uh, and I'm just going to share my screen once again with you and here we go so we have um sorry I'm just... so here is a classic picture that could be part of a wild flower meadow but um imagine that his three mates have disappeared because this is what's happened in this is a, a study. We've got a lot of um, publicity recently. Uh, Dave Goulson, who, of course, spoke at the same conference as I did three years ago, and I believe spoke to you recently. And I was chatting to Dave the other day. You know, Dave's done fantastic work on this. But he publicized this study in Germany, which was pretty shocking. that flying insect abundance had fallen by 75 percent in just 30 years. However, it's much, much worse than that. 
And the reason it's worse than that is, and it, this only came out later on with that story, that this was not a study of the abundance of flying insects across Germany. It was a study of flying insect abundance on nature reserves. So it's, if, if the abundance has fallen by 75% on nature reserves, or what on earth has happened in the rest of the country, in the rest of Europe, in the rest of Britain? And we know that we have a more denuded and worse wildlife than Germany does. We know that. You know, we're almost at the bottom, I think, of the European League table, apart from Ireland. Um, and we're missing out on the insects, of course, but we're also missing out on this sort of thing, you know, that the, the joy that people get from wildflower meadows. And it's both an aesthetic joy, but of course, we've learned recently that being out in nature and bird song, which of course birds feed on the insects that feed on the nectar, um, bird song isn't and being outdoors isn't just good for us in a sort of namby pamby oh we feel a bit better way it genuinely improves our mental health and that clearly we're, we're suffering an epidemic of mental health issues now so going for a walk in good countryside as opposed to poor countryside with butterflies with bumblebees with birds with wildflowers is going to help people um and then in my home county uh, of somerset this is a a, a view across um at the back of me when i've been on my um recent uh um walks you know my, my lockdown walks this is where i walked and that's brent knoll in the distance which some of you will have seen if you're driving up and down the m5 it's it's uh we live about well it's about five or six miles away from there but very visible from where we are um and the countryside behind our home, it's these sort of wet meadows. They're, they're called moors, interestingly, and it, they're not really moors in the way Dartmoor and Exmoor are. But I think moor, it either just means waste ground, I've been told, or, you know, um, or it means, I think it comes from mere, but as in moorhen. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a not particularly prepossessing and beautiful area until actually you spend any time in it and you realise it is. But it's still being farmed. It's farmed um, relatively benignly uh, in parts. and not very benignly in others, but there is wildlife there. So again, you know, during lockdown where so many of us, and I know many of the people here tonight are not in the, the countryside, you know, you're, you're in towns and cities, having places to go, and of course, wildflower meadows thrive in towns and cities as well, and I'll come to uh, unusual ways in which they do later. Um, but, you know, these things are very important to us. Meadows, of course, have a cultural importance. So um, many, many writers and poets have written about them. And uh, before we started this, Kevin asked me one question. He said, are you going to talk about John Clare? And I said, yes, I am. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit from a John Clare poem uh, written probably about 200 years ago, probably to the year. Um, and of course, Clare was a great observer of wildlife. He genuinely, un unlike his fellow romantic poets who he sometimes lumped with, he actually knew what a nightingale was and he knew, you know, what the birds were and the flowers were. And when he talks, of course, when he speaks about um, the meadows, he's talking about, he's not just thinking of meadows in the abstract, he's thinking of a meadow by where he lives. So I'll just read you a little bit of this. Maytime is to the meadows coming in. And cowslip peeps have gotten air so big, and water blobs and all their golden kin crowd round the shallows by the striding brig. Daisies and buttercups and lady smocks are all about and shining here and there, nodding about their golden yellow locks like morts of folk and flocking at a fair. The sheep and cows are crowding for a share and snatch the blossoms in such eager haste that basket-bearing children running there do think within their hearts they'll get them all. And, you know, it's it's like all Claire's poems. They're lovely. They're lovely to read out loud. Um, but he wasn't the only one. Christina Rossetti, another uh, 19th century poet, wrote a short poem about meadows. Very short one, but rather lovely. In the meadow. What in the meadow? Bluebells, buttercups, meadow sweet, and fairy rings for the children's feet in the meadow. Jacob's ladder and Solomon's seal and love lies bleeding beside all heel. 
So people have always loved meadows, but of course, with fewer meadows around, you'd think people wouldn't um, be writing about them anymore or talking about them. But of course, the whole concept of a meadow, the word meadow still resonates with us. And I thought I'd show you one of the greatest um, environmental activists on the planet, Daryl Hannah, who's actually a really seriously environmental activist. Uh, I don't know who the bloke next to her is. Oh yes, he's that quite famous um, singer, Neil Young, her, her partner. But she wrote this and, uh, um, and I think we should all do this. She said, my ideal is to wake up in the morning and run around the meadow naked. I don't have a picture of Neil Young, so this is, uh, or, or Daryl Hannah in Meadows, so this is Kevin, oh, it's not Kevin, is it? No, um, this is someone naked in a meadow, but you know, you get the picture. But it's again, that sort of joy, isn't it, of the idea that meadows mean something to us. So where are the meadows? Well, you've got some up on Dartmoor, you've got fantastic meadows, but there's a lot of meadows that we don't think about. And during research for a book I wrote, published last year called The Accidental Countryside, um, I travelled around Britain and I visited lots and lots of places that were basically created originally for our own use. We created these places that I feature in this book purely for us and nature either stayed there or took them over later on. So it's everything from churchyards. I start with Moosa Brock on Shetland and of course it runs through uh, canal banks and railway cuttings and golf courses and military sites and gravel pits and peat diggings and roadside verges and brownfield sites. And while I was researching this book a couple of summers ago, I travelled around Britain and also before that I'd done quite a lot of travelling around looking at these places. And I came across a lot of things that look like wildflower meadows or are getting close to it, you know, this sort of, you know, what we used to call wasteland, waste ground. And this is a classic example, and there are wildflower meadows here, I just didn't have a picture of one, um, which is Canvey Wick in Essex, um, known, uh, it's been described as England's rainforest. But Patrick Barker made a very good point. He said, it's not really England's rainforest, it's England's savannah. Um, and this is a wonderful place. You know, it has more insect species than anywhere else in Britain, except Dungeness, so it's a phenomenal place. But the other place I came across wildflower meadows that really look like wildflower meadows was here. This is Blandford Forum in Dorset. And Dorset County Council have spent a little bit of money over the past few years transforming their roadside verges into wildflower meadows. And what's great about this is that, you know, the, the cars stuck in the traffic jam or the people like here driving through into their housing estate rather like it mostly. Um, and more importantly, in a sense, it creates wonderful habitats for wildlife. So you're hitting the people thing and the wildlife thing. But the thing that really sold it to me in this time where we're having to look at, you know, possibly yet another bout of austerity is that Dorset County Council saved their council taxpayers £93,000 every year by changing the mowing regime and spending a little bit of money planting some wildflower seeds, but actually mostly it was just changing the mowing regime. So it works for everyone, isn't it? It's a winner. And yet on Twitter during the spring lockdown, you may have come across this as well on social media or in the newspapers, endless examples of thoughtless destruction of wildflowers, you know, they're messy. There was a case in Bristol where in Totterdown, which is uh, a sort of, you know, it's the sort of top nest of Bristol, if you know what I mean. You know, it's quite, quite niche your own muesli. And the people there had done a lovely wildflower meadow and the count, they just hadn't told the council and the council then hadn't told the contractors not to cut it. So the contractors came along and cut it. And I heard about this because a very good environmentalist in Bristol called Alex Morse, author and environmentalist, was arguing on Jeremy Vine's show with a guy who was so how can I put this tactfully, was so beyond the pale in his views that he had been expelled from the Conservative Party, which you have to admit takes some doing, doesn't it? And this guy was doing the usual thing of saying, well, it's just a mess, it's just a complete mess, things like a mess, you know, well, this one, proper grass, you know. And Alex argued very well for it. But, you know, it was sad that you still have to make that argument. While researching my book, I also contacted Kent Wildlife Trust and went along to a 
place where they'd had um, 17,000 orchids in bloom along a roadside verge. And in the January before the spring I went, the contractors had turned up to do a bit of drainage and had literally scraped the entire roadside verge clean of earth and of course destroyed all the the, the orchids that were going to come up um so we're still fighting this you know and and i think the importance of these meadows is you know i know they're not real meadows but they sort of are because what they are is a place that people can have access to in their daily lives in towns in cities in the countryside along a roads along motorways so what of the future? Well, we've established the crucial importance of meadows in, in ecology, history, culture. So are meadows going to now disappear and become a sort of rural museum piece? You know, people will have to go along to a nature reserve to see them. Or are we on the cusp of a positive change? Now, I'm not going to get into the, the whole Brexit issue. You'll probably be very pleased to hear. But Clearly, the common agricultural policy wrought a huge amount of the damage that we have seen in the past 70 years, really, or 50, well, slightly less, but it continued the damage from the 50s. Um, and that is going. And we are told that there will be a new system that will be much more uh, wildlife friendly, much more for the common good. Well, let's see. I don't know. Um, but at the moment, and forgive the pun, the grassroots movements like More Meadows and others, and individuals doing great work in town, cities and in the countryside, are a start. And they can help each other. They can advise each other as you're doing. They, you know, Once you start these grassroots initiatives, all it takes is for someone elsewhere in the country to hear about it, contact you, and then hopefully they will they can then roll it out because all the things that you set up that took time to set up and a few mistakes that are made along the way they won't make them so hopefully that's that will work and i'm going to leave you with um before kevin has a chat with me my favorite meadow quote that i came across which from a french author i didn't know called georges benanos um and i think it sums up the subtle beauty of meadows he said little things seem nothing but they give peace like those meadow flowers, which individually seem odourless, but all together perfume the air. So over to you, Kevin. Wow! Thank you very much, Stephen. That was uh, that was fantastic and a great a great ending. Um, really good. We'll have a, a, a chat for a bit because I want to pick up on some of the things that you've talked about. But I'll start, if I can, with John Clare because we both love John Clare. And I always think of John Clare for three things particularly. And, and you sort of mentioned that and you touched on it and it came across in the poem. And, and somebody's asked for the name of the poem. So I might ask you to, um, to also read out the title again. Um, the three things I always think are John Clare's attention to detail. He knows his birds. He knows the colour of the eggs. He knows the, the habitat. So it's that attention to detail. The second is empathy. He, he really has a, a, a sort of a love for the natural world. And the third is loss. And there's a quote that I always think of when I think of John Clare, which is, um, O words are poor receipts for what time hath stole away. So we're, we're left with things like Bunting's Close and Woodpecker Drive and Meadow, Meadow Bank Avenue, for example, because the Buntings, the soil Buntings have gone, the woodpeckers have gone, the trees have gone, the meadows have gone. So there's that sense of loss about him. And I just wondered, what do you think Claire would have made of our countryside now? Because he lived through enclosures and all of that, and that's why he was talking about loss, but nothing like now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think it would have added to his chronic clinical depression. Um, <laughs> you know, let's face it. Um, I mean, he did. I suppose the difference is a lot of the loss we know, we hear about, don't we? We read about it, we hear about it. It doesn't make it any less important. In fact, you know, the loss of the Amazon rainforest, the loss of certain species like the turtle dove, and it can be from personal experience, and sometimes it's not. It, you know, you know about it, but you don't see it. Whereas all Claire's loss 
was experienced. He he had this massive change. I think the best analogy with Claire is actually not what's happened in the countryside now. It's if you grew up in a place like Sheffield or Birmingham in the 40s and 50s, and then when you perhaps in your teenage years in the 60s, everything changed because they literally knocked down everything and you know, you couldn't recognise the place you were in. I always think, I don't know many people who went through that, but it must be very similar, that sort of horror. Margaret Drabble wrote about it very well in her novel, The Ice Age, about the horror of trying to get your bearings in a place that you grew up in, but has completely changed. And that's what happened to Claire, of course, in his, I think he was in his 20s when Enclosure really hit. Um, you know, and he, he would talk about not knowing which direction in the sky, corner of the sky the sun is in um so i think you know but i think one of the problems is the loss that we've seen has been has actually been more gradual than that because it has taken place over 70 years and there's been ups and downs there have been you know things have got better where i live on the somerset levels you know i literally I had to go to the shops today and i literally drove past 90 cattle egrets in a field and my daughter was like, why are we stopping? And I said, well, I just, I just wanted a quick look, but I didn't even get the bins out because why would I? Because, you know, so things that, you know, certain things are good and are better than they were, but in very small patches, as you know. Um, I think the other thing about Claire is he had this extraordinary strong sense of his place in, in the place he was brought up. He literally knew a certain tree and I found last year in lockdown walking around this loop that I walked around and I ended up writing a nature diary about it was I suddenly thought I know it's not like being John Clare but just for three months it felt a little bit like that in that I was confined to this one place with all the downside of that but then trying to see the positives and the positives were seeing those tiny changes day by day and week by week that he would have perceived that when I lived in London for the first 45 years of my life I never noticed you know suddenly the Swifts were here and it's like oh sorry it must be nearly summer you know so I think I think that really yeah I, I I I had the same when I worked in London exactly the same the seasons would pass but you get off the tube and not see anything and and, and that disconnect for many people I think is is part of the problem I think what I think what you said you know some things are improving and let's hope we'll come on to the to the to the good side but i just wanted to to ask you a bit about shifting baseline syndrome which you mentioned in your talk and and in a sense that's what claire had he grew up with that the concern is for people who haven't experienced those things at all either because they grow up in cities and it's just not there or even the expectation when you grow up in the countryside that it's always been like that. And I think, you know, I, I just I just wonder how we overcome that. Some of that is is things like your film and paintings and poetry that bring that to life. But uh, how, how do we how do we respond to that? Mm. Otherwise, just older people telling younger people it was, you know, it was much better in my day. Well, it was much better, except I didn't see a sparrowhawk till I was 15. I didn't see a peregrine till I was 22, literally. didn't, You know, so actually, you know, lots of things, you know, there are, of course, losses and gains. I think the urban thing is very interesting in that most of the sites I visited for the accidental countryside were either semi-urban or urban, not, not all of them. But what's happening in London, which is the city I know best because I was brought up there, is that old industrial sites like Walthamstow Reservoirs, Woodbury Wetland, well, Woodbury Wetlands with Stoke Newington Reservoirs, are being turned into these fabulous places for wildlife and people. And the people is probably more important than the wildlife. And so I'll give you an example. You know, so I actually always think that living in city, you see quite a lot of wildlife because A, it's quite tame. Foxes, herons, kingfishers, you know, if you're going to see them, they're going to sit there. They're not that bothered by you. Whereas here, they're going to fly away. But also, actually, most people in cities in Britain that I know that have a lot of wildlife, Newcastle, Bristol, Edinburgh, London would be my obvious ones, but there are many more, um, particularly some of the smaller cities, particularly cities like Swansea and Cardiff on the coast, you know. Um, they not only have a tremendous amount of wildlife, but actually the local people and the local conservationists, but actually tends to be just local people, have transformed sites 
that would have gone to waste or been built on into havens for nature. One argument, of course, is I wish I hadn't had to write that book because I wish that it, you didn't need these. But, you know, the fact that Tower Hamlet Cemetery Park or Canvey Wick or Woodbury Wetlands are top sites for nature is a bit stupid, isn't it? You know, the, the countryside should be the top site for nature and then there should be, yes, nice to have places you can access. But actually, many of the places I've visited are incomparably better for wildlife you know, open, part of it, the open cast coal mine in, in near Bridge End, for example, is you know, massively better for wildlife than anything around it. And that and that is true of most of these places. But they're also under threat, as you know, Candy Wick. You know, there is a, a proposal to, I think, put a theme park on Candy Wick or somewhere around there. I mean, just because we've squeezed it and then we don't value it, it's 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 constantly under threat from developments because nobody really you know pays attention to these these sort of spaces. Mm. I just want to come back to, to meadows for a bit and and talk about you know maybe a bit contentious, but but actually you mentioned this re, uh, hay meadows are really re relics of a of an agricultural system that's left them behind. So horses that would have been the main engines of the countryside have been replaced by tractors. Yeah, most of our most cows now eat more grain and soya than they eat grass, um, and clearly hay has been replaced by by silage. Yeah, is it a bit sentimental to want this back? Is it is it as you said just a bit of a luxury now, or is there a way to bring it back into our agricultural systems? I think that's a tricky one. I mean, I would not ever claim to be an expert on that side of it all i know is whenever anyone tries to do something and everyone immediately including conservationists say well a it won't work and b you'll never make any money from it and then you see nep and you think well hang on they're making a lot more money henry um oh god what's his name wonderful man oh, children henry Edmonds. you know i visited there i filmed there and he said to me Everyone says, well, of course, you know, your yields are really low and you won't make any money. And he said, yeah, but I'm not spending any money. So, my, you know, I make a decent profit. He said, I don't boast about it because it looks like I'm boasting, but he makes more money. You know, yes, of course, subsidies are involved in here. And the better you are for wildlife, even under the CAB, if you were very good, you got more money. But clearly, um, it can work. And also, of course, you're going to need a mixed economy. You know, I, I don't think anyone would ever suggest that the whole of Britain should return to some sort of pre-industrial revolution, you know, agrarian, you know, men with sides and, you know, that sort of thing. Clearly, that's not going to work. But yeah. that doesn't mean you can't make it work in certain areas. I think I think, I, I think that's right. And I think, yeah, that that... I even spoke to somebody recently who said that he decided to um, breed breed his lambs for the Easter market when they went for a premium. And then he worked out that the costs of feeding those lambs over the winter meant that he was losing money on every one of them, even though he was getting a higher price. And this balance between input and the, 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 the costs of production versus the income that you're receiving is one that I think a lot of farmers aren't yet aren't yet aware of because yeah. they've been sold that this is the system that you need and we need to rebalance that i think there are good things like agroecology and regenerative farming which are looking at uh, how you can balance the system particularly with the end of the common agricultural policy um I, I, I wanted to talk to you about nep and rewilding because you you know it was interesting that you you um uh, brought up Isabella Tree's book, and yeah, it's great, and I'm sure you're right. Many people will have read it. It's become extremely influ influential, mm -hmm. and and there are some wonderful successes, you know, like NEP, and I'd also, you know, RSPB, the big landscape scale work that RSPB is doing at Abernethy, for example, and all part of Cairngorms Connect. This is a massive 600 square um, kilometer rewilding experiment over 200 years. Um, and, you know, there's, there's an element of that of, you know, people have stepped away and nature has come back. But at the same time, 
you know, we, you talked about this, meadows need management. They need cutting and they need aftermath grazing. And, uh, and to some extent, the worry, or is it a worry, that we've divided or could divide the countryside into two? So it's a sort of land, land sparing. We'll have intensive agriculture producing food in part of the countryside, denatured, nothing living in it. And then we'll have either nature reserves or the rewilded areas on the other side. And the two are far, far apart. And what we'll have lost is what perhaps we've had for 4,000 years is farmland with nature. And the two have been mixed together. And that's why you know, hay meadows, full of life, full of the insects that we've lost, full of the birds that feed on them, the hedgerows around, a lot of the intensive industrial countryside doesn't have any of that. And I just wondered that land sparing, land sharing debate that's going on, is there a third way? I think there is. I think in Norfolk at the moment, you're seeing there's quite large chunks of Norfolk where people who are not quite as stuck in their ways, and I understand why you'd be stuck in your ways. If you spent your life doing it one way, of course it's going to be difficult, but of course you've got new generations coming in. But I know there are a number of farmers in Norfolk who have already um, gone down the route of, you know, but it isn't one or the other. It's not binary. They're not not producing food. In fact, um, I heard that one, and this is only anecdotal, I'm afraid, but during the two or really three drought summers we've recently had, but we had two in a row, didn't we? And then last summer wasn't quite as dry. Yields um, on arable land in Norfolk, where, of course, it's very dry, were falling um, by up to 60%, except in the estate where they had already used some of NEP's um, ways of working. And guess what? Yields there fell by 20%. So, yes, yields fell, but not as much. So, you know, and I think once you start getting patchworks, and I know, you know, a guy who used to work for the RSPB in Devon, who some of you may know, and I won't mention his name, but he told me this story that he would go and see a farmer and he'd convince them that the best way was, you know, they could, he could help them apply for the, the high level stewardship if they did certain things. And they'd say, all right, no, you've convinced me, but please don't tell my neighbour. And then he'd go around the neighbour and the neighbour would say exactly the same thing. And by that time, he'd had five or six of them all saying, well, don't tell anyone else. But they were all doing it. So, you know, I think, you know, but clearly there have been massive barriers to doing this. You know, the bureaucracy, the, the DEFRA bureaucracy that was put on top of the EU bureaucracy, as um, a farmer in Somerset told me, who's a very successful farmer in both senses, wildlife and farming. And he said, you know, if, if some kids joyride and dump a car on his land, he has to, and, and if it's inspected that week, you know, and the car's still there, he has to take out a small bit of his field from you know, to get the subsidy, things like that. You know where you live, don't you? That, you know, you, you can't allow scrub to grow up. You can't allow hedgerows and, the, you know, these sort of things because you'll lose money. And farmers shouldn't be losing money to help wildlife. That's absurd. Yeah. You know, it's I just think it's really silly. Yeah. They, you know, they are doing great work. And, I, you know, I still remember Derek Moore, the late Derek Moore, my dear friend and great conservationist, a real visionary, taking me to meet Chris Knights, the great Norfolk farmer, who at the time produced all Tesco's root vegetables and had 50% of Britain's stone curlews breeding on his land and about 10% of the grey partridges and tree sparrows in the farmyard. And, again, Chris is a proper farmer. You know, it, it's not this dichotomy of, you know, millionaires who've made a huge amount of money being pop stars buying a farm and then telling farmers what to do you know it's not like that these are these i've over the years filmed so many brilliant farmers the marlborough downs in wiltshire again huge yields but tree sparrows montague's harriers breeding every occasionally you know lapwings everything barn owls you know so it can be done it, it can, I mean, somebody's put in the chat, and I'm going to take this uh, as a prompt. Time for a plug about Hope Farm. And of course, this is uh, for people who don't know, this is a farm in Cambridgeshire, which is uh, owned by the RSPB, it was bought 20 years ago. And it, it's, a, it's a conventional farm, so it's not organic. But over those 20 years, it's been monitored. And Stephen, you'll know uh, as much as I do about Hope Farm. And bird numbers have gone up exponentially. They're monitoring butterflies have gone up, bumblebees have gone up. And it's actually quite simple. Many of the interventions, 
and the farm is still profitable. In fact, it's more profitable now than it was previously because they're, they're now leaving strips for predators. So there's natural uh, pest management. So the reduction in the amount of pesticides that's being used. So I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot that can be done. And there are demonstration farms out there like Hope Farm, but there are also really good farms out there doing, doing these things. And I think there is an excitement. There's a shift around this. So I, I sort of want you, you, you talked a bit about, you know, the ecological crisis and the broader issue. And of course, I think most people are now aware of the impact climate change is going to have, but there still isn't perhaps the awareness that the extinction crisis that, that, that we're possibly going to face, when I say possibly, I sort of think unless we do something about it, it's almost inevitable. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded there's a, a piece that Ernest Hemingway wrote in uh, The Sun Also Rises, where uh, one character asked the others, how did you go bankrupt? And, and his answer was, gradually, then suddenly. And I sort of think that's the same as possibly with extinction. You know, at the moment, everything's gradual. You know, we've lost the northern white rhino, we've lost the Yangtze River dolphin, but most people aren't really aware that it's... But we are seeing, as you showed with that slide about flying insects, the, 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 the decrease. It's gradual, but the cliff is coming. And I just wondered, you know, in terms of species, getting the message across, but also you know, how, how we can get that message more across in the way that I think climate has been, but nature hasn't. It's very difficult. I think, um, you know, both those issues are so huge and so terrifying. I mean, let me flip it on its head. The biggest environmental message success in the last two or three years has been the plastics from Blue Planet 2, made by my former colleagues. Yeah. And it was hugely successful. They interwove it into the story and then they hit you with it big at the end. So they did it really well. They didn't just have it at the end. But they didn't also say we're going to make a program about plastics, which literally seven people would have watched. They said, no, here isn't it wonderful, but it's in trouble. And here's why. The thing that struck me, though, having obviously worked in television for, for longer than I care to remember, was that the reason they picked plastics was that you can film it. And you can't film climate change. Now, I haven't seen The Perfect Planet that went out at the weekend, where Alistair Fothergill, my old boss, has done a program, a leading peak time BBC programme about climate change and our effect. So good for him. Well done to do that with Attenborough narrating it, you know. But climate change is really hard to film. It, you know, television is impressionistic and anecdotal. So an albatross with plastic stuck in it, or you can't cut open a dead dolphin and pull out plastic from its stomach. It's A, horrific, and B, very memorable, and C, it's going to make you do something. But plastic, while it is very important, is nothing like as important as the two things you've mentioned. I mean, it really is the next level. It's it's horrible and it's contributing to the extinction crisis. But the extinction crisis and climate emergency are much bigger. But we really struggle to do those. Our brains can't deal with that. We can deal with buying a, a, a metal water bottle and remembering to fill it and not buying plastic. And that's good. And we feel better about it. And we should. But well done. Yes. But we can't deal with, you know, those those huge things and I think, I I think it's a big issue i know people who are optimistic but they're optimistic because of things like china embracing renewables you know they're they're optimistic because they say actually globalization technology and politics will save us because that again it's the tipping point the other way isn't it it's the fact that we go on about it but i don't know you know it's very See, I always think of you as a glass half full person. Oh, okay. which is and there's a quote from Aldo Leopold if, uh, from a Sand County Almanac. If anybody hasn't read it, I'd really advise to do it. He, he says something like, um, uh, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And I, and I just think, I don't see that from you because uh, I'm not sure about optimism, but hope. And I just wondered, what is it that, that drives you and gives you hope that we can address these these crises. It, it is nature, but well, it's nature and people. It has to be. You know, every day I go out, I take, as you know, Rosie, our dog, which you made me get. I take her for a walk because the kids can't be bothered anymore. 
and I walk around this loop at the back of my house. And yesterday it was windy and a bit crap and whatever. And then a marsh harrier flew over. And a marsh harrier is a bird that when I was 13, I went to Minsmere. My mum took me to Minsmere. And we sat in a hide. And Bert Axel came in, the great warden, with a big party of VIPs. And my mother very quietly said, what's that big brown bird over the reeds? She was not a bird watcher. And yeah. Bert Axel went, oh, my goodness, madam, it's a marsh harrier. Well done. <laughs> and then he turned to these people and explained that there was one male and two female marsh harriers in Britain. And now I get them over my house. Yeah. You know, and, and when I moved to Somerset 15 years ago, there was one pair pair or whatever you know possibly one male and two females and i didn't see them for a couple of years and i saw the old one and i saw a few more and now you know they've become a bird we ignore so i've always hopeful the danger of that of course is that by relying on what you see particularly if you live in southern britain which many of us here do i know not everyone does but obviously you do and i do is there's a real problem, particularly if you live in Somerset, in that everything's getting commoner. I, I exaggerate slightly, obviously not a lot of the smaller birds, but we're getting all these new species. And I wrote a piece for The Observer recently about the fact that you see three species of egret. Yeah, I saw 90 cattle egrets today, and I have barely, you know, oh, that's, that's more than I've seen before, but not much. Um, and I wrote this piece about the fact that, of course, why are they here? They're here for a very good reason. We created a fantastic habitat for them. These flooded fields, you know, these these well farmed areas, but they're really here because of climate change. And of course, it's very dangerous by using anecdotal evidence. But that, but the Catholic group is a very good example of a bird that shouldn't really be able to survive here. If we had proper winters that we did when we were kids, it wouldn't. It might migrate back and forth, but it it wouldn't survive. And so that's an example, you know, where we have to be careful. But I have to be hopeful because otherwise, you know, you'd give up, wouldn't you? Yeah. And yes, I, I agree with you. And so am I. And, uh, uh, and like you, every time I go out for a walk, there's always something that yeah. Yeah, catches my attention. I never come back and think, well, that was dull. As soon as you're walking in nature, there's always something new. One little tiny thing, isn't it? One tiny thing. Absolutely. I yeah. saw two goose anders on the river just uh, the day before yesterday. And and it just, I've seen goose anders before. But the fact that there were two male goose anders sitting down there, it just lifts you. And that that's the, the thing. So I, I'm, I, I've got so many other things I, I, I want to ask you. But I'm, what I'm going to do is just open it out to other questions because we've got some other people coming in. And and, uh, and I'm sure I'll throw in a few more things as we go on. So let me just have a look, see what um, people have, have said. So um, Andy Pratt asks, what role do you think plant-based diets have in saving global wildlife? As new UN-backed report says that the vicious circle of cheap but damaging food is biggest destroyer of nature. I think we might take a slightly different view on this, given I'm the vegetarian. <laughs> No, I, I I take the same view as you. I'm just I just haven't done it. Yeah, weak. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So you know, this is the problem, isn't it? That I did, you know, in my defence, I now own an electric car, and my entire house is heated by solar panels and air source heat pumps. So I sort of feel I've done something right. But does that um, negate the fact that I am also contributing to the crisis, as Andy says, by eating meat? You know that's the tricky one, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I and I, like my view. I don't like people pressurizing. I know you don't do this, um, Kevin, but you know I don't like people being holier than thou about what they do, yeah. because they often do one thing really well or several things really well, but then they do something else, and you think, well, hang on, yeah, you don't fly, but you do. You know, you've got all these other things you do. Well, you don't eat meat, but you fly all over the world, you know. So I think we have to be careful, but clearly we need to move in that direction. The irony is that the book I brought out recently on the swallow it occurred to me at the end that the swallow is not commensal with human beings as everyone says it's commensal with cattle basically well cattle horses cheaper yeah. broadly it commences with cattle if we move towards a world where cattle become and this is probably a good thing much scarcer what will happen to swallows yeah. particularly yeah. if all the other things are happening like climate change but but you know so the complexity of the the, the way the world is and you talked about 
earlier, you, you mentioned something and I thought, yes, it's this idea that there's a wilderness out there. That's what really annoys me because there isn't a wilderness. We've affected everything. But whatever we do now, and we will, of course, change farming and change things, there may be unexpected negative consequences and there may be unexpected positive consequences. But, you know, these things are very hard to, to work out. At the moment, the reason swallows might start to decline is if all cattle are brought into industrial units, which is horrible, you know, that's even worse. So maybe if we have fewer cattle, but we feed them outdoors, you know, on hay meadows, then hay meadows. Yeah. it work <laughs> Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I, I, I joke because I am... Uh, as you know, vegetarian, but I, 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 like you, think that farmed animals, which have been around for 4,000 years as part of the landscape, and the other animals depend on it. You know, we, we have animals on our land because we've got greater horseshoe bats down the road. They rely on large beetles, particularly dung beetles. I think, I think you're right. It's systems again. It's not... Uh, that the animals are bad. It's how we treat animals. So, fifty percent of our milk now, non-organic milk, comes from cows that never go outside. So, from these mega dairies, even in this country, um, and a move towards mixed farming, where animals are giving the fertility rather than buying it in, and uh, having animals fewer animals, not worming them with chemical wormers because you won't need them so much. I think these farming systems, I, I've read The Farming Ladder, which you mentioned, and it's a fantastic book. And he shows that you can have a farming system that's both productive and uh, friendly to, 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 to wildlife and nature as well. So I, I think you're right. What's um, that Michael Pollan phrase? It's something like, eat less, most I, people's. Yeah, I think you know if we can reduce our meat consumption, if we can improve the quality of the food we eat across the board. But of course, at the moment, the whole system of subsidies and cheap food makes that extreme, and 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 processed food lasting longer and being cheaper. You know that's that's going to create problems. But these are big problems to deal with. They are. So I've got two uh, which are sort of connected, but Paul Hardy wants to know how we get a national movement to make our roadside motorway verges and embankments wildlife friendly. And Kate Smith also asks if you have any tips for converting boring grass verges into wildflower rich areas. Um, dealing with the second first, there are some fantastic books on it, one of which I bought because the guy was giving a talk at your last conference a uh, really nice guy, and he did this brilliant book on meadows and how to convert them, and I've got it here somewhere. I'll see if I can drag it out, but there are a lot of very good books. And, of course, you know, Chris Baines's classic How to Make a Wildlife Garden goes back there, but I, I am absolutely not an expert at the practical transformation of anything into anything else, but I think it's a, a good thing. Um, the first question, sorry, was the um, Paul's one on... On how to, to get a national yeah. movement. Oh, I, I, this is where what's interesting is I think that when I think social media, which has a lot of problems with it, can really work here. And I'm only on Twitter. I only do Twitter, but I do a lot of Twitter. And I did a lot because of the lockdown. And I noticed that every now and then someone will post a picture of a roadside verge in May in Norfolk that had just, you know, before and after been, it had been cut. So what I did each time was tag it and say, Dorset Wildlife Trust, Dorset County Council, can you contact the Norfolk Wildlife Trust and the Norfolk County Council and work with them? Because you've done a really great job, you know, and, and I hope that happens. So I think you can create that. What I do know is that Craig Bennett, who's now, of course, running the, the Wildlife Trust and, in my view, running extremely well, has got various ideas for these sort of national campaigns, which the Wildlife Trust do rather well because they have that local input. And I believe that Roadside Verges is going to be won this spring. Don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty certain that they're planning that because it's it's a fairly easy hit. And if you can say to, particularly to, to voters who might be a bit um, a bit worried about the mess outside there, their homes or along the roads they drive to work in. If you can say to them, we've saved you 20 pounds each on your council tax, 
that's going to work, isn't it? So I do think that using social media to connect people and say, you know, Accidental Countryside was all about that. You know, I visited a golf course in Sandy where the assistant greenkeeper, Stephen Thompson, who's been there for 20 years, is obsessed with wildlife and create, you know, makes the golf course good for wildlife. And it really is purple hair streaks and all sorts of things, you know. And there is now an organisation that does that. So why can't all the golf courses be like that? It's not very complicated, is it? If you want to do one thing well, like roadside verges, um, you know, you can. But there are people who've been campaigning for this. Tony Sangwan, who worked for the Highways Agency for many years, and I filmed with him, and he did fantastic job on a roads and motorways which they were responsible for creating basically you know linear wildflower meadows and he did it again by arguing to his superiors that he could save money you know he's a very clever man that's that's how it works you know you you find out what will work with the people who make the decisions and then tell them that and then it will work so so plant life i know has got and has been running a campaign in Burgess. so, so there are, there already is something out there and I'd, I'd encourage people to look at plant life i think i think the other is i think you're absolutely right for councils saving money is probably the way there but also i've seen when i've driven through wiltshire last year there were signs up on the verges saying this is a trial wildlife verge so explain to people as they drive through that this isn't just a money-saving exercise and that it's messy, but is doing something positive for nature. I think people respond to that. So the more social media is a great way of doing it, but there are also other other ways. I think my 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 only concern. I I talked to Dave Ramsden at the Barn Owl Trust about verges, and of course, one of the issues is that barn owls tend then because the fields are you know, have been grazed down or cut, barn owls then have been forced into the roadside verges, which is extremely dangerous. And we're seeing more barn owl deaths on roads. But well, that, that's the unforeseen consequences. Do something good, yeah. but it affects something else. And you have to weigh that up always. Yeah. But yeah. it's still better, I think, to have roadside verges. But it will be better still to have hay meadows in yeah. The, yeah. the official countryside. I, I completely agree. So I just wanted, I just on on that, you know, we talked about meadows. I just wanted to ask you, um, yeah, meadows are fantastic for wildlife in the summer because they're full of insects. You know, provided there's a hedgerow, the birds are coming in, they're feeding on them, and so on. But once they're cut. Yeah, a lot of that wildlife you hope will survive as eggs or caterpillars and miss out on the cut. But actually in the winter, when birds particularly are looking for food, they're not the best things. What are, what are the other things that people can do on land if they've got land or even in a garden that is going to attract wildlife um, more than, than yeah. just being a meadow? Well, the farmers at the Marlborough Downs, which I filmed a few years ago, and the first thing the, the farmer there who I met and got to know very well said to me, he said, I'm not, he actually said, I'm not some bloody hobby farmer, you know, I'm fifth generation. I need to feed, you know, the people, my family, and I need to make a profit. And I said, good, I, I agree completely. He said, well, we just so we know where we are. And then he took me around his farm, which was awash with wildlife. It was, you know, dripping with wildlife because he loves wildlife. And so, he did both, but he had things like, you know, the seed strips. So, you know, planting the right plants so that in autumn and winter you've got, you know, seeds. And and they did something very clever. Matt Pryor, the tree sparrow guy there, um, he was consulted. They had Firstly, they hired an ecologist because they got a small amount of money. I think it's £70,000 or something from the government to do a nature improvement area. So they hired this very good economist, Gemma, Gemma Patton, I think her name was, and she got to know local people and matt who's obsessed with tree sparrows they did a study and they worked out they tried to work out why there were tree sparrows in three completely separate places and they realized that they needed big bulky hedgerows for breeding then they needed you know insects obviously in spring and summer and seeds in autumn and winter and and there were two other things they need and, and if any of those five things weren't there you weren't really going to get tree sparrows and so 
they recreated that in different places. I know in Devon that's been done with seal buntings. Again, I think there are the three things they need for breeding, feeding summer and feeding winter. So there's a lot of knowledge out there, the RSPB, the Wildlife Trust, and these amazing, you know, that, that phrase amateur naturalists, i.e. they're not being paid, but they bloody well should be. You know, and there's so many of these people in Britain that do know. So you can normally find someone locally who will help you and advise you, particularly on practical things. And I think, you know, you, sometimes you have to be quite persistent to find the right person. But if you talk to enough people, and again, I think social media works really well. You know, a, a, a trivial, a trivial example. But two days ago, my friend um, Graham, who's not on Twitter, is writing a book on called The Nature of Cricket, and it's about cricket grounds and, you know, how nature finds their way to cricket grounds. So it's a slightly, you know, tongue-in-cheek book, but there are some very good examples. I stuck it on Twitter, and, so, you know, I'm overwhelmed with responses of people wanting to help, which is lovely. If you put on Twitter, if you say, look, I re I've got this these five acres of land and I really want to do something with it, but I don't know what, you will get help. And there's a guy in Somerset called Alastair Cameron who's doing Somerset rewilding. And he bought, five years ago, he bought two fields, a wet one and a dry one. He spent about, he spent a couple of thousand buying them. Then he spent a couple of hundred pounds hiring a digger for the day and digging out a scrape. And then he left them for five years. And they are astonishingly good for wildlife now. And he is now trying to start this up in this way to say to farmers, look, just put aside a tiny corner, you know, really other organizations will do the big stuff, but let's do lots of little stuff because that will really work. And he's got harvest mice, he's got, you know, all sorts of spiders, dragonflies, damselflies, wildflowers, lapwings and snipe in winter, breeding birds in summer, you know. Um, but he said, I really haven't done anything, <laughs> just left it. So I think I mean, one of the things the RSPB has been working on is, is, is a fair to nature mark and looking, doing the research into how much land you do have to leave in order to get wildlife back at, in, 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 at the levels where you would say this is a healthy ecosystem and it's growing in the way that you've talked about without leaving all of it. But those, those unproductive patches and it's around 10 percent. Now, yeah. At the moment, it's really hard under the Common Agricultural Policy to put 10% of your land for wildlife because that's then deemed to be ineligible features and you'll have your basic payment docked by 10% as well. And farming is, you know, by and large, so marginal for many people, particularly where we are in on Dartmoor and in the uplands, that putting 10% aside is just almost impossible to think about. So I'm hoping that the new shift towards the environmental land management scheme in England with public money for public goods will encourage people to think, what more can I do? And you're right, these the, the, the people are out there. There's a lot of advice. And I just wanted to read you something that um, Chris Throne uh, he said, he's enjoying your talk from a beef farm in Northern Ireland. So it's, Elms is not going to be there. He loves wildlife and does what he can to support it, but finds it difficult to support it more and make a living from farming. What can he do? Mm. Well, unless things change, possibly not very much. Obviously, I don't know his individual circumstances, but this is the problem is that, as you say, farmers, I, you know, I'm surrounded by farmers here, sheep farmers mostly, and some cattle. And of course, they're on the margin and they work bloody hard and they, you know, and and, and they're at the mercy, of course, of the weather and, and it, you know, climate change, like the fact that last month it has just rained solidly in Somerset. And now, you know, lots of fields are underwater, which is OK if it happens a bit, but not fully. So, you know, I think this is a real problem. We need to be able to say to people, we will support you if you do these things. I still have a big issue with um, farm subsidies. You know, it... <sighs> philosophically, I mean, I can see why it happened and I can see why we need them now. But, you know, my wife's a nurse. When she used to go to work, she got paid. She didn't then get an extra 20 grand a year for existing. And I know it's not quite the same because it's land, but I sort of, you know, I, and when I wrote a book and mentioned this a few years ago, Wild Kingdom, 
I got an email from James Rebanks who said, I completely agree with you. Yeah. I think, you know, we're, we're trapped in this thing. And, of course, what, what farm subsidies do, they don't subsidise farmers at all. They pay the farmers for the money they don't get. So it's very much like universal benefit. Universal benefit subsidises employers. Most people who get universal benefit are not unemployed. They're working, but they're on such low wages that they have to be topped up. So who benefits? The employers. Yeah. And, you know, what happens with farm subsidies is the supermarkets benefit. Fundamentally, and the, and the agrochemical companies, and the agrochemical industry, exactly, yeah. and and various other people, you know, and I'm sure John Deere tractors as well. So yeah. we 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 live in this world where the money is going in the wrong thing. So it looks it looks like it's being paid to the farmers because they get it, but it's effectively there as a top up for what they should have got for for doing a good job yeah. and for their product. But no politician will ever say to the public, you know what, we're going to effectively double your food costs. Yeah, because it's subsidising low wages as well and as universal credit is. But that's a that's a sort of different conversation around um, the social contract that we could have. But uh, you're absolutely right on this. And I, you know, the hope is that moving towards paying for the things that the market doesn't, i.e. not food, but carbon, biodiversity, water, clean water, clean air, at least rewards farmers for the things that at the moment are just seen as 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 free free assets out there. Well, they're so, free assets, or, or the farmer is losing money. I filmed a number cool. of just for a series I did on bees a few years ago, and they said, "Yeah, I'm lo I put seven or eight percent of my land into this, and I'm." Some of them said, "I'm breaking even on the money because I get slightly extra subsidies, but of course it it takes a lot of my time, which is real money, yeah, as yeah. well." Or yeah. they were losing money by doing it, and that's. That is ridiculous. But as you know, the report said yesterday that came out, Amazon is worth whatever it is, $2 trillion, and the Amazon rainforest is worth nothing until you cut it down. Yeah. And that, and that, you know, that, that's an example, a big example globally, but it's the same with our land, isn't it? Well, there was the, the, I don't know if you've seen it yet. You prob probably haven't read it because it's 600 pages long, but there's... Yeah. a the review that came out yesterday, the Das Gupta review, which is exactly on this, the economics of biodiversity that the government commissioned. And of course, you know, there is this debate between those who believe that unless you put a price on nature, it is not going to be valued. And therefore it is, as we say, it's just, you know, a, a, a free goods and those who think, well, as soon as you put a price on it, and how do you value something like birdsong, there is somebody who's going to come along and say, I'll give you more than that price in order to cut down that tree or uh, plough up that, that hay meadow. And I think that's, that's a, a big debate that's going on on economics at the moment. But it seems from the, the review that the balance is we will not we will not value nature properly as part of the economy and build it in not just as gdp unless we put that price on it but well, ironically of course you can put a value on birdsong because it genuinely improves people's mental health it's very hard to to put a monetary value on it but clearly if birds didn't exist people would uh, weren't singing forget the the environmental issues that raises there would be more mental health issues which cost the NHS a lot of money. But what we can't do is measure that. Yeah. Because we can't yeah. isolate birdsong. Yeah. So you know, I, I, I saw a brilliant debate a few years ago, a very civilised and extremely well-run debate between Tony Juniper and George Monbiot on this exact thing. And George was arguing the very purest view that you cannot... It, once you start valuing nature, you're on a, it's like being a part-time virgin. You know, you're on a slippery or, you know nearly pregnant, you either are or you aren't. And he said, once you start valuing it, how do you value a Skylark? Because a Skylark is either priceless or, um, or you know, valueless. And, you you know, it doesn't clearly have, apart from, yes, as part of birds, it doesn't have any economic benefit, whereas beavers do have an economic benefit. But Tony convinced me, certainly, that you have to you have to go down that route because if you don't, as you say, it will all go. And it's all very well then being purist about it, but we're, you know, so. 
Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree, and I will read the review. I think we've got time for, for um, you know, because we've been chatting, and uh, uh, one more question, which uh, you've mentioned a couple of uh, books. You've mentioned um, Isabella Tree's Wilding, James Rebanks, and I'd certainly say that people should, should read uh, his new book, English Pastoral. But Bethany Cayley wants to know what both of our wildlife nature book recommendations are. Um, I already mentioned Mrs. Morrow's Warbler, written by uh, you, <laughs> which I'd certainly recommend. And uh, uh, but what what else? You go, you go. Well, just while I'm finding it, I just want to say that presumably Mrs. Frone, who's posted here, is Chris is still outside working with his cattle at quarter to nine, right in the dark. So that yeah. proves the point, doesn't it? That he's having to work as dairy farmers do, or beef farmers, sorry, beef farmers in this case, those are ours, they deserve a bit more reward, you know, for doing something for wildlife. But the book I would recommend... Well, um, can I just, before, while you search for that, just say that there is something I'd encourage people to read if they're farming, and that is a report that came out last year. It's online. It's called Less is More. And what it's saying is that farm profitability goes up provided, uh, and this is directed towards livestock farming, provided the animals are eating only the naturally available grass. As soon as your inputs go up, although you might be producing more, the costs outweigh the benefits of that extra production. So it's not like producing widgets. And, and while you've got that freely available grass that the sun and, and the soil produces, you can make a profit. So it's counterintuitive because all of us believe the more you more you pump out at one end, the more profit you're going to make. And I'm afraid that's not. So that less is more report, I'd, I'd certainly encourage people to have a look at. Okay. Well, the, the book I would recommend, and I did write the forward for this, so I'm biased, but I wrote the forward for this when I didn't know it was going to be such a big success, is Rebirding by Benedict MacDonald. It's a very thorough book. It's got tables in it. It's got, you know, graphs. It's got lots of details because Benedict's a very thorough sort of guy. And it, it tells, it's basically a manifesto, a very positive manifesto. And Ben was very keen to involve farmers and politicians of all sides and not try to, you know, be hostile. So it's very different from some authors and some books who basically set themselves against lots of things. Ben's very four things but he uses the eastern europe model you know effectively to to you know when you go and it's like going back in time when you go to poland or hungary to the countryside even still and you go there and you can't believe the bird song and the insects etc but it's basically a manifesto for that but he has a phrase in it that i think i can remember i haven't read it obviously for a couple of years since i read it before it came out but i think he says that all the things that we could do that would not that would bring back all the birds in the sort of numbers, and he's done the statistics, the numbers we need, you could do it without touching arable land. Yeah. He said it would be good to use arable land, but you wouldn't actually have to. If you did it purely on areas that are now uplands, forestry areas, and other areas, you wouldn't necessarily need to use arable land. So mm -hmm. it it, it's a brilliant book. It's very, very interesting. Ben's a very engaging young guy who I think, you know, he's he sees the world differently from a lot of the older writers. He's more open. And he's more aware. And he talked to a lot of people. And I think, you know, I'm fascinated to see what he does next. But it's a great book. Yeah. Well, he's just produced a book called Orchard as well. Yeah. Yeah, which is also very good. I, I agree with you. I think Rebirding is is one of those books that just sets the dial, makes you look at the world in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's 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 a great a groundbreaking book. Um, I, I just want another plug for a Sand County Almanac because I think it's a a brilliant book and it's still as relevant 
for anybody interested in ecology and how things work as, uh, 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 as, as it was when it was written back in the 40s, I believe. Um, just a fantastic book. Stephen, we're going to have to wrap it up. I've still got questions that people have asked and, and I've got more that I wanted to talk to you about. You and I will have to have a, an offline conversation about various things. There's some other questions here. We'll try and answer some of those. I see somebody's asked about swaling, which is more dark, more related, and soil and soil and the regenerative qualities of soil. We could just keep on talking on this, but um, I'm now going to hand back uh, to Tracy just to wrap things up. But I'd like to just thank you so much, Stephen, for the conversation, for your presentation. Really fantastic. We can't clap, but we'll do it silently. Well, it's been a real pleasure, Kevin and Tracy. And, you know, it's, it's so lovely to know there's so many people out there and that, that you've attracted such a wide range of people because we, we have to work together conservationists farmers naturalists landowners and that's i think what more meadows does you, you know it's not like we're telling you what to do and please don't think at any point if i've sounded like i'm telling you what to do i'm not i don't have most of the answers but what i would say is there's people out there who do have the answers to almost any question you're asking so find them and they will help you brilliant thank cool. you thanks Dean. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you so much, Stephen. That was really, really interesting. Um, so I'm going to just quickly wrap up and say thank you as well to everyone who's tuned in and putting such a, a great, great selection of comments in the chat box. That's been brilliant. Um, if you're involved with Medio Creation and um, Restoration, do think about joining our forum. And that is, a, as I say, communication platform so accessing all those people that do have some of those answers to some of the questions that we've been talking about and i just wanted to say that our next talk is on the 25th of march at 7 30 again um, when we'll have matt pitts from plant life who's actually going to talk about how we do some of these things they guide us through the steps of meadow creation restoration and management um, the talk's free um, again but you will need to register and um, more information will be posted on the events and news page of the forum um, on the address below. So that just remains to say um, thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you soon.